Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Decoded Digital. I'm Leon Cavalier. Uh, I'm your host, and I'm the founder and director here at Door 4. This is our November edition of Decoded Digital, uh, part of the regular series of events that we run here at the agency uh, to share our knowledge, share our expertise, and introduce you to uh, insightful and hopefully entertaining speakers. I'm really excited to announce that we are starting to make plans for real in life, uh, in real life events again, then you get to see our faces. Uh, but for now, uh, we are here on Zoom. More of you will get the chance to meet us in 2022 as we take Decoding Digital on the road to Manchester, Lancashire, and hopefully beyond. A quick intro to Door 4. We're a performance marketing agency uh, based here in the Northwest. We work with dozens of companies around the UK, Europe, and the US, uh, working on our philosophy of reach, convert, and scale, which powers our service offering with paid and organic search, user experience and conversion rate optimization, and web development to underpin our strategic optimization. Today's event is It's Good To Be Bad, and we'll be talking about how brand acquisition and data all interplay crucial elements of any performance marketing strategy for businesses that want to get to the future faster. Today, we have three fantastic speakers uh, who are joining us. Given, they've each given up the time to be with us, share their expertise, uh, and we're delighted that we've got them with us today. First up today, we're going to have Mark Wilson home and Jamie Kelly from Studio Up North, uh, two seasoned brand and communication specialists talking about brand purpose and performance and how brand values and articulation play a crucial part in any strategic performance marketing. We have Dominic Harrington, a CRM expert with 20 years of experience in technology. Uh, Dominic's a published author uh, and is a Zoho development partner. Uh, today talking about optimizing your CRM data to drive focused performance marketing. And we have Tom Morton, Dorfo's own head of acquisition, who will be talking about how to work less and earn more in digital, which is definitely a principle we can all get behind. Tom today is going to be talking about Pareto's 8 to 20 principle and how it can be used uh, to spend less time and get greater results out of digital marketing. So um, I'm going to quickly talk about the agenda today. I'll tell you what's going to be going on. We'll be here for around about an hour. Uh, we'll go through our three speakers. For those of you who are here on Zoom today, you can use the Q&A, ideally, or the chat to ask questions to our speakers. Uh, we'll go through each of the three speakers, and then we'll collate the questions towards the end and, and put these to uh, our three panelists. So I'd encourage you, those of you who are on Zoom, to use the, the Q&A or even the chat. Those of you that are watching on LinkedIn Live today, Hello, this is the first time we've done that. Uh, we invite you to uh, submit your questions in the LinkedIn comments uh, and we will collect these and we'll ask these. There is also a link to the Zoom webinar if you want to jump across to join us in Zoom. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into our uh, first panellists. So we have Jamie Kelly and Mark Wilson home. Uh, I'm going to invite them to join us here in Vision. You two are going to be talking about brand purpose. Um, we'll, we'll relieve all of our stresses and I'm going to hand over to you and we'll, we'll jump out of Vision. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. We're, uh, we're Jamie and uh, Mark from Studio Up North. Um, we abbreviate that to Sun. Um, and we're going to talk to you today about brand purpose and performance. Um, a little bit of an intro into ourselves um, to start off with uh, and who we are. So I say we're a, a relatively small agency based in Lancashire, which is uh, in Rottenstall. So we're just not too far away from, from Leon and the, uh, the great team at Door 4. I say we are purposely small. Um, the reason why we're purposely small is so that we can maintain our relationships with our clients so that we can always try and keep these kind of affairs where it's always ourselves. Uh, again, we're a very, very small team based in Rottenstall. Um, and we've got a very simple ethos. Um, we say we are bold, diverse, vibrant and passionate. And the essence of honesty, fairness and pride runs through everything we do and everything we create. And that's essentially the most important thing for us as an agency. The thing that we say is that we are... Um, honest and we have integrity and we are passionate about the work that we do. We do this with businesses from startups through to sort of 350, 400 mil turnover organisations where we work in three key areas, which is brand strategy, identity and brand creation and branded content. And part of this um, talk we're going to talk about today is around branded content, um, but more importantly, how brand purpose informs brand performance. And there's a massive overlap between performance marketing and brand performance and brand purpose. So in terms of our purpose, um, we look and um, the first question we, we thought that was there for us was how can we make people's lives better? 
Um, and we didn't want to say that um, we make people's lives better by the work that we do for our clients. It, it's far too woolly. So what we hit on really is our purpose was to say that we can help our clients create a better world by helping them to make their clients' lives better. And we, that does run through everything that we, uh, we do. We look to work with uh, clients who are very purpose-led and um, this is really what excites us. It, what, it's what gives us meaning and it, it is our purpose. So in terms of a question, um, what is brand purpose? Um, this is a, a question really that um, continues to come under scrutiny at the minute. Um, due to the rise of conscientious consumers and also there are on the opposite side of the fence a number of marketeers who believe that the role of marketing is very much still to just sell stuff. Um, so just before I start a little bit about my experience with purpose-led organisations. Um, I started out working many years ago with uh, the brewing giant Scottish in Newcastle and latterly en ended up working on their community support programme. Uh, the programme was launched to support causes across the North West and this was very much done because the brewery at that time had closed down two of the region's breweries and um, they wanted to give back something to the community. Um, it was seen by a few to be a cynical PR move, but others also applauded the way in which we, give, we were giving something back. Uh, more recently, I've worked with a number of uh, social housing associations and very often they've got an undeserved reputation as being faceless landlords, when actually what I found through working with housing associations is that they care deeply about the welfare and well-being of their residents, and they work hard to do as much as possible to increase quality of life. So um, starting out, we've got a, a quote here from the, per, from the book On Purpose, which was written by Andy Milligan and Sean Smith. And that is a book that I recommend people read. It's a superb book. It talks about um, delivering a branded customer experience that has purpose very much at its heart. And certainly the rise in online competition is hugely topical at the moment. Uh, the way in which COVID has provided some online retailers with their most su successful period of sales uh, contrasts very sharply with uh, many other businesses who have found that um, obviously survival as being the focus. So as we embrace the, uh, the new reality, uh, one question that um, I wanted to ask really is, should business leaders be rethinking their purpose? Or as, a, as another way of putting that question, you know, why do they exist as a business beyond simply making money? Well, the attitudes and motivations of people towards what they buy and what they do and why they buy it um, has very much changed recently. And as I've mentioned, there is a rise in the conscientious consumer and the conscientious consumer is someone who really wants to buy brands that have a sense of purpose. And they want those brands to address the wider social challenges that we all face. And whilst many business leaders feel that purpose is merely a fashionable buzzword, this is something that's definitely not going to go away. In fact, purpose mustn't be confused with sustainability or greenwashing. It isn't a campaign geared towards, towards profit. It's something that successful businesses will be increasingly characterized by a common sense of identity. So what you'll see here with this quote, every business must serve a social purpose. These aren't the words of a social campaigner. They're not the words of a politician. They're actually the, the words of a banker at the world's at one of the world's largest banks. And as we know, Barclays has been involved in at least one major trading scandal over the years. And it actually has the dubious honor of being the most fined bank in Britain. So I can understand that there's probably many of you out there who are very cynical about the words that um, the, the CEO of retail and business banking has said here. So the banks control money. So why should they concern themselves with a wider purpose? The reason is that society is now demanding that they, they do have a purpose and they're very transparent about it. When the banks first started, 
they were um, they were launched really to help people fulfill their ambitions and over over the years the banks have really very much lost sight of what they're about and instead of um helping the community they have very much become focused on their efforts to uh, drive profits that in many cases people see are, are very obscene and this is quite often being done at the consumer's expense now following the fallout from the scandals and the global banking price crisis the banks realized that their failure to have a purpose over and above profit has in fact lost them customers so barclays has been on a, a journey um, of internal transformation since the scandals and it's a journey that's helped them discover a more positive side with initiatives like digital eagles um, life skills and in actual fact the bank has seen an, a return on investment with those um, with, with those initiatives that um, as far as stripped the return on, on investment for ads that actually talk about current accounts and mortgages and coincidentally this slide I'm showing here um, whilst I was working on the content for this presentation uh, this popped up onto my uh, LinkedIn feed and as you can see, it's not just Barclays who are talking about purpose. Um, indeed, all of the banks are talking about it. In this case here, HSBC have actually um, announced that they're making over $1 trillion available to help businesses that um, are finding financial hurdles uh, on the route to becoming more sustainable. So going back to uh, the why, Simon Sinek's view of companies um, are that they uh, com should communicate from the inside out. And there are a number of uh, business leaders and marketeers who actually disagree with this. Uh, in fact, only yesterday, I read an article that was entitled Purpose, the Advertising Industry's Greatest Lie. And in this, the, uh, the author actually said that brand purpose is mostly uh, nonsense talk. Um, he went on then to attack purpose and called it actually a layer of bullshit applied to pull the wool over the eyes of global uh, consumers. And writing about uh, Starbucks, he actually said that um, time again, time and again, we encounter the lofty, admirable sheen of brand purpose, only to discover that it flakes off with even the slightest scratch to reveal a darker, more commercial subsurface. Starbucks' famous mission to inspire and nurture the human spirit one person, one cup, and one neighborhood, one neighborhood at a time is about as lofty as it gets, but it contradicts the company's abject inability to align its tax responsibilities. Now, this is an article that I, I read with horror because I, I felt that, um, yes, nobody's perfect in, in the strive to, um, to have a higher purpose and be better at what they do, but surely if we can all strive to be just a few percent better then the, with the way they work, then certainly the collective effort will be hugely significant for us all. And surely in this article, citing Starbucks tax debacle as a reason to ditch purpose altogether, surely this is akin to arguing to ditch the NHS due to the actions of, of one rogue doctor. So the indisputable fact is that purpose drives and motivates customers and employees alike and that can only be of benefit to your business as a whole and engaging and empowering employees is vitally important to spurring motivation so how do we adopt purpose well simply talking about a purpose and these being empty words isn't enough to maximize performance if you're able to link your purpose to a strategic vision of the company in a way that gets people aligned and working towards a common goal, then this gives you the opportunity to outperform your competitors. And there are three components that purpose must have in order to drive performance. These are authenticity, alignment, and advancement. <clears throat> and as this diagram shows, um, an authentic purpose is something that is designed and discovered or from the inside out. And what that means is that rather than talking about the, the how or the what, instead we talk about the why. 
an aligned purpose complements and enriches and replaces the mission statement and it's the glue between the organizational vision and values it resonates with stakeholders because it encourages contribution into the furtherance of the business's individual purpose an advanced or advancing purpose generates passion for principles i.e how we behave support and help each other or hold each other to account and it holds focus on what matters most and with the limitless options that are now available to consumers via digital channels this means that they are choosing to engage more and more with content that resonates with their own passions and their own purpose whereas once once at a time they were forced to shop locally and deal with businesses that were in their immediate geography now they are able to um, effectively shop anywhere so when there is an option to either buy with a business that uh, has a purpose and fits with their own ethos that is the route that uh, customers will will go down in fact with the rise of the conscientious consumer you'll actually find that there are um, a great many number of consumers out there who are actually seeking out uh, companies that fit with their ethos and their beliefs. So basically, consumers want to do business with organisations that are driven to make the world a better place. And by saying this, in one sense, we're going back to the future. In the 19th century, businesses were quite often founded uh, based on a, a higher purpose. Companies like Kellogg's, Rain Trees, Quaker Oats were all founded uh, on higher purpose. For example, cereals that were originally made for the uh, Battle Creek Sanitarium to help soldiers injured in, uh, in, in the war um, were created by Will Kellogg. And from there, he went on to build the business that we all know and love today. So the difference now is that a sense of purpose is so shared by customers, they actually feel that they have an affinity and a sense of loyalty with uh, with a business that they want to uh, interact with. They are increasingly testing the way that um, how authentic an organization is. They judge them by their actions, the words, and they will take the word of the average customer or customer facing employees over and above the um, shareholder directed statements and when they're judging in simple terms they look to uh, find out what they hear from people to whom they most easily relate ordinary people just like them so yeah even though the digital world has transformed how we experience the promises that brands make it's also transformed our ability to be able to shape the promises that companies make and also it allows us to tell other people about our experience, whether these be good or bad. But the fundamentals of brand building haven't changed. And the fundamentals are here on screen now. Gain continuous insight into what your customers want. Know how the purpose of your brand helps your customers. Be clear about your promise. And most importantly, deliver on those promises. Now, as we already know, people have this infinite choice available and the last thing they want is a sameness of experience. So where the digital world can excel in delivering a compass purpose is where there is a desire for an experience over and above just buying a product or a service. So in order for companies to invent and innovate regularly, they have to have unprecedented levels of intimacy with their consumer. And of course, the online environment facilitates this relationship. Companies need to tap into as much real time information as possible. Uh, find out what the customers like and don't like. What are their wants and desires? And in order to build loyalty and trust, they need to um, incorporate this data into their promises. And as we've already said, deliver on those promises. And this data can only be provided by the digital technology arena so in summary the thing we should communicate is the why we do it in other words what are we as a business or individuals working to achieve over and above profit having an authentic purpose 
means that we are in continual conversation with our customers, finding out what their wants, needs and desires are. And customers will readily give you that information in the expectation that they, you will actually use it to improve their experience. And as we've said, with the limitless uh, options that are available via digital channels, customers are choosing to engage more with companies and businesses, and they're making uh, decisions on purchases with brands that um, share their same ethos and that are personally relevant to them. In order to address this, purpose-driven organizations consist consistently do three things very well. They stand up for something that they believe in and something that will de deliver value to improve the lives of their customers and consumers. They consistently deliver a customer experience that is distinctive and relevant. And they deliver this across all channels. They create a culture to ensure authentic delivery over the long term for the brand. So what is a brand? So we're not a brand, we're not a digital agency, we're a brand and strategy led agency, but the brand purpose and the branded content is essentially important to how it works with brand performance. So we start off by talking about what is a brand and an identity is not a brand, a logo is not a brand. A brand is your proposition, it's your value to people, it's your strategy, it's your call to action, it's your customer service when people pick up the phone to you, it's the way you speak, it's your people who work for your organisation, it's your facilities. And then, of course, it's your purpose. And the way we describe a brand <clears throat> is that, you know, we, we, we describe a, an identity or a logo as a, as a pair of eyes almost. You know, there's some people who have, you know, absolutely beautiful eyes. There's blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes. Uh, there's people who look sad. There's people who look tired like I do this morning. There's people who frown a lot. There's people who uh, look surprised. But until you actually speak to that person, until you actually engage with them and interact with them, you don't actually know what that person could look like. And someone could have a beautiful set of eyes, but actually when you chat to them, they may not match up to how they visually look. So an, an, a great and beautiful logo is something that will immediately capture you as a person and immediately engage with you. But until you speak to that person and until you, you know, find out what they like to eat, where they go, what they stand for, what their mission is, then you don't actually understand what that person is and that's how we treat a brand we treat an identity as something that can be beautiful and engaging but until we find out the actual bones of that person you don't understand what they stand for and we think that we we look at brands like we look at our friends and our family and whenever you're talking to someone and whenever you're speaking to a friend or a colleague or an acquaintance or someone you've just met and you might meet them again is that generally as people and as human beings our, our nature and our instincts is to look for consistency because inconsistency worries us you know inconsistency makes us you know, fret and panic about things. And it also makes you judge people and look at how you would trust them because if someone's not consistent, you don't know how they're going to behave and you don't know what to expect from them. So we look to our friends and our family, like we look at our brand and we look for consistency within that. And and, and Martin Neumeyer says that, you know, a brand or um, how you engage the thing is, is all the interactions that a person would have with your product or with your service or your organisation. It's not an identity, it's not a logo, it's not even a visual language. It's everything that that organization stands for. And therefore, when we work on, on, on businesses and we work with strategy and we work with branded content, we always look towards something that you know is consistent. It, it must look the same, um, it must be engaging, it must sound the same and have the same tone of voice. It must speak in the same way and it must be coherent and people must be able to come familiar with you and what you stand for and what you, you are trusted for and what you are known for as a business because that way there you bring consistency and you bring loyalty and trust. And membership and, and brand are two very similar things because like we say, and like Mark's pointed out before, in, in a world that is you know, bewildering in terms of competitive climate, which rational choices become almost impossible, brands represent clarity, it represents reassurance, consistency, status and membership, everything that enables human beings to help define themselves. And a brand represents identity, not the other way around. And, and that was a, a quote from, from Wally Owens from, from Wolf Owens. And, and just to, in case people are wondering, what am I referring to when I'm talking about brand or branded content? Branded content is something that people might think is a relatively new thing, but actually it's got a quite a big history when you go back to, you know, Colgate sponsoring the happy hour on TV and when soap operas became soap operas. Um, it is content that's created directly linked to a brand, which allows a consumer to connect with it through their values and purpose, not necessarily the products, 
or the service that they do. But whilst it's been designed, it's so that the viewers can subconsciously make the connection between the two. Because at the moment, and especially since in the in sort of post and current COVID era, um, we get served so many adverts and we get served so many um, so many products and we we get asked to lots of things about ourselves, try and choose things, buy things, already get things when you're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you look looking people trying to serve you information and it's human instinct just to filter that information out and there's there's vast amounts of marketing that we're having pushed under our noses that have no relevance or interest to us but we're getting served it anyway and branding content is designed to address that issue because it's trying to emotively connect you and the audience with the brand and its values and purpose rather than just thrusting a product under its nose and 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 a service under its nose and you know therefore branding like i put in the previous slide the audience, a consumer, when the, the audience isn't a consumer at all, it's just someone who wants to learn more and find out more about you as, a, as an organisation. And branded content builds that advocacy and awareness and through education and through storytelling and, and through purpose. So what should it do? Um, you know, it, it's value focused, you know, it's focused on the values and the purpose of the brand, not the products, you know, there will be product placement in there potentially, there will be, you know, a general nod to what the business does, but it's not going to be shifting things and putting things under your nose. It's trying to generate conversation, notoriety and added value for the user. And most important, importantly, it appeals to emotions, uh, it uses storytelling. And then why it's so important, why it's it, all that's of performance that can be used in multiple formats and in, in multiple channels. So just look at a few examples of, of what branded content is. You know, one of the most famous um, brands for branded content is, is Red Bull. And everyone will be aware of, I've had to write his name down here because my little boy's called Felix, but he's called Felix Bongana. Um, and everyone will have seen that he'd be the space mission he did. And it's one of the most famous pieces of branded content. And we know it's obviously jumping out of space is not to everyone's budget, but what this meant was that it, um, Red Bull became synonymous with athleticism, adrenaline, the love for risk taking. And this opened up the world, you know, half the world or half the planet, you know, watched this event because it's such an unbelievable event. But like I say here, the event's not selling a kind of Red Bull, it's selling the brand values of excitement, adrenaline, adventure, extremeness. And, you know, epitomizing Red Bull's purpose of giving wings to people and ideas and that anything is possible. And according to estimates, they're very coy on this Red Bull, but according to estimates, the returns from the advertising from this, and you can imagine the, the budget behind it, it, it was tripled in terms of the, the increase in um, brand uptake. And the event was just really memorable and had a long-term positive effect on the brand. Um, moving on quickly to, to the co-op, um, this is just an incredible um, piece of work. And I was very lucky to, to work with the co-op when they went through the rebrand in 2016, but I'm just wanting to, to play, um, play something to you guys. choose co-op food. A share of the money goes to funding local causes in your community. It's not a one-off. It's what we do. So the campaign focuses on the investment co-op put back into communities from its food, insurance and funeral arms. But it's about building stronger communities by being a stronger co-op. And that's what a co-op does. It's all about the values of co-op, you know. The values from COP is about community, it's about responsibility, about equality and solidarity and, and their purpose and proposition of, of it's what we do. And if you go onto the COP website, they talk about principles and value and value, but the principles are more valuable than profits. And that's what a COP's built on. You know, it's about sharing and community and helping each other. And that's tough part talking about their brand rather than talking about their products. Yeah, we're talking about co-op food and shopping there, but it also talks about the higher being of what co-op are trying to achieve. Uh, I'll, I'll flip through this one because I'm just conscious of time, but this is a really important piece from, from Adidas about a guy called Carlos Ruiz, who's based in Argentina. I, I won't play the video just because of the time side of things. But the video essentially talks, 
talked about Gary Aspen, who's, who's from Blackburn, who, who went to, found out about a, a shop in Argentina where a guy who had had really unfortunate circumstances was collecting Adidas Specials. And it's just an incredible piece of content. If anyone chan- gets a chance to go and view it, I'd, I'd strongly advise it. But the story encapsulates everything that a brand advocacy stands for. The guy had thousands and thousands of pairs of Adidas Specials within his shop. And it's a search for term that relates to Adidas trainer, that's cult like status. And it is the absolute essence of branded content because it tells an incredible story that you want to watch and share. And I, I got it shared by my old my old um, managing director when I worked at Brother. Um, it's something that educates the viewer about nostalgia and history. Uh, it leaves you something that you want in more, but it's truly emotional also. Now, these are obviously really high level and big sort of budget campaigns. And one of our clients that we work with, although um, you know they've, they've kindly allowed us to do this, is saying that actually, you know, you can tell narrative through other things such as, you know, digital applications and storytelling through carousels. And if you look at this set of imagery here, it's all great imagery and it's all lovely. And this is how they used to promote their, their sites and how they used to talk about getting membership and getting people to, to visit their sites. And they just used plain imagery like this, which was absolutely fine. But just by having a really simple narrative that ran through this imagery, where there's so many places to explore, so many adventures away, so many memories to make and so many sites to see, you can get away your way. And it really epitomised the Caravan Club's um, ethos of helping you get more from the great outdoors. And just through this campaign, the membership acquisition and how they acquired new members went absolutely through the roof. And we've been continuing doing uh, campaigns just with simple little bit, bits of storytelling throughout for them. So how do you deliver it? So we talk about brand purpose, which is why you do what you do. And then we look at brand messaging. How do you talk about this? We then look at the brand visual identity. How does this look? And then the brand narrative. So how do you tell the story? And then you look at performance. Where do you tell the story? So where do you place it? And we, we have a delivery architecture, which we look at, which is brand purpose and messaging first into storytelling about how we can depict that through verbal and through visual um, devices, and then deploying that through the right channels. So whichever channels are suitable for your performance. And what this does then is it creates the awareness and consideration before you get to the conversion side of the brand funnel. But then it flips it around where you're creating loyalty and advocacy because the awareness is done through purpose and through values and through mission as opposed to through products and services. You're trying to basically stop trying to treat people treat people as ATM machines, you know, people who want to go buy things all the time. You're giving it a bit of a wider berth and giving people more of an option to learn about your business, which will create that loyalty and advocacy. And getting the right mix is really important. You know, you know, you talk about above the line through TV, print, radio, billboards, that kind of thing, and below the line, you know, potential Google ads and targeted display, but also through the line, you know, geo ring fenced adverts via YouTube and social, et cetera. Um, and the reason why we talk about that is that it's all about consistency. Again, I go back to that slide that I put previously is that whichever channels you choose and whichever performance partner you work with, it's all about consistency of message, story, narrative, and visuals to ensure that you are creating loyalty, trust, and advocacy with your clients because you want people to make sure that you look the same, sound the same, and speak the same way. Because as we said numerous times through this presentation now, that creates trust, it creates advocacy, it creates authenticity, and that creates loyalty. And the results from that can be really powerful. You know, brand content is really influential. It's been shown that through this piece of um, piece of research through Nielsen that it's increased revenue by 33% through some businesses. And some stats even show that 91% of consumers would prefer to make a purchase from an authentic brand. And branded content, honestly, on Facebook is optional, but it should be seen as essential as long as it's valuable, consistent, and authentic. And it's all about brand recall. You know, when person watches branded content, their brand recall goes up 59% higher than it is with product display ads. And viewers are almost 14% more likely to seek out extra content from the same brand as far as return investment goes. That is a super strong number. And you don't need a huge blockbuster budget like launching someone out of space. You just need a really good strategy, a really good purpose, a strong identity and visual language, and a great story to tell. So in summary, we suggest that we look at defining your why, build your identity and visual language, tell your story in the best way possible, be ultra consistent, and then choose your channels, which again, this does not mean jumping out of space, jumping out of space or a TV advert. It means where you feel comfortable as a business in yourself and for your audience. That's everything. I spoke very fast there, the last 10 minutes of that, I'm afraid, but yeah. That's us. <laughs> Great stuff. Thanks very much, Jamie Kelly, Mark Wilson Home. Uh, fantastic presentation there on brand purpose. And it's it's really refreshing to see uh, such a, a real analysis of how brand values and brand language can really help to 
accelerate the all aspects of marketing and, and connections with the business, with the brand. So uh, thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate you uh, spending your time with you. We've got rid of most of our technical gremlins now. I think so. Uh, we'll bring you back in. At, <laughs> we'll bring you back in at the end. Uh, we've got some questions that are starting to fire through. So I encourage anybody that's uh, that sat and enjoyed that fantastic presentation. If I have any questions to Jamie and Mark, who I'm sure we'll be able to uh, really delve into more answers. Thanks, guys. I'm now going to move on to our next speaker, who is Tom Morton. Tom is Dofor's head of acquisition. So Tom looks after our organic and paid search here at Dofor, among some other channels. Uh, Tom, this morning. Hi there, Tom. Hello, how are you doing, Leo? Good morning, I'm really good. Uh, yeah, they're from, they're deep in the bunker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tom, this morning, is going to be talking about the 80-20 uh, the principle, working less and earning more in digital, which is is definitely something that I think uh, our attendees and our guests this morning want to, want to hear. So without ado, I'm going to jump off, Tom. I'm going to let you take the mic. So Godspeed. Perfect. Okay, uh, I think everyone can see my screen, uh, hopefully. So, um, just a hello, I'm Tom, I'm from Door 4, and I am Head of Acquisitions. Uh, just a little bit about me, I've been in digital for over 10 years now, I've got specialisms in uh, search, PPC, and digital marketing strategies. And uh, in that time, I've worked with a wide range of clients, uh, some in e-commerce, some in lead gen, and I've worked with the smaller startups, all the way up to uh, some big industry players like Samsung, but I can't really take that much credit for Samsung's growth over the years, if I'm honest. It was a very small contribution. So the title of my talk is Work Less and Earn More. And I'm sure when Leon read the title of my talk, he saw Work Less, got a bit dubious, but heard the Earn More bit. So he was probably quite warm to that idea. So when I speak to people in businesses, generally they have two fundamental problems. And usually it's these two things. It's both time and money it's usually one but you know it's usually always both it's not really constrained to the size of business um or you know it could be a one-man band who've got quite a lot of uh, capital investment but they just don't have the time to implement the right strategy and uh, likewise it could be a massive organization with a big marketing team but they haven't really got the time to do everything that they'd like to do and uh, in agency we have the exact same problem uh, I mean, ultimately, we are really limited by the time that we can deliver to our clients, and that's usually down to the budget that they can give us. Now, we're also limited by media budget. So within that short period of time, what we really need to do is deliver the biggest return on investment with the limited time and money that we have available. And as Liam mentioned at the um, very out, uh, outset of this presentation, we very much have an ethos to work through the reach, convert and scale framework. Now, it's a, a three pronged strategy, which really did get popularized in 2020. But I believe we've been doing this a lot before um, the pandemic happened and uh, we had uh, the three strikes slogans. But the basics um, of this is want to reach the right customer. And I mean, that ties in quite a lot with what uh, Jamie and Mark were saying. Reaching the customer is really one of the most important things you can possibly do. But it's even or even as important to get that right customer to convert on the website. And then what we do is we review that data at the end of that, and then we look to scale. So that's quite similar to what my talk's going to be about today. And I absolutely promise this isn't a sales pitch. I've not got anything, uh, no ulterior motive, but the one thing that I'd like to give uh, anyone listening today is just offering value and give you some actionable framework. Put an asterisk at the end of that, because that's because you've got to go away and actually do the work yourself or pay someone else to do it or how are you going to work it? And uh, like I said, I don't have a book for sale, I don't have a course or a program. So I will ask you two questions. That's the only thing I want from you guys right now. And that's, do you feel busy? Now, I personally feel very busy but I feel busy in a proactive way. Now, I've noticed since the pandemic, a lot of people feel busy and they're just trying to get back on the feet and they're trying to make a lot of noise and it's not really as focused. But I've got a second question for you as well. Have a think about who your favorite customer or client is. Now, that could be a very, very easy question to answer or it could be a quite a hard one. But uh, generally, we find it's one of these. And I think for 99% of people, it's this one. It's the customer that pays the most money. Now, I can guarantee most people did think of that in the first initial one. But how did that customer find you? Was it a word of mouth kind of thing? Or was it more of like a, a PPC campaign? Was it a search campaign? Was it a bit of branding work that you did? Just have a think about how did they find you, your favorite customer? 
And now think, how do you get more of them? Now, that's probably a more challenging question that you probably can't answer in one simple statement. And that's where you need to do your big reviews from. Then ask yourself, how much am I actually willing to spend to get one of these customers or even more of them? And finally, does your marketing strategy currently reflect this? I've seen a lot of marketing stra uh, strategies done by external agencies, done in-house, and a lot of these strategies do not reflect who should be targeting the perfect customer for your business. And even if you know directly all the answers to the questions that I just asked, this framework should still help you. It's the 80-20 principle. And I've used this in some way, shape or form for nearly every single one of the clients that I've ever worked with in my whole professional career. And in a nutshell, the Pareto principle basically states that for many of the outcomes, roughly 80% of the consequences come from 20% of the causes. Other names for that are the 80-20 rule or the law of the vital few or uh, the principles of a uh, factor of sparsity. Or in absolute layman's terms, 20% of my time and or money directly influence 80% of the outcomes. So you might identify with a few of these. I mean, 20% of the sales rep generate 80% of the total sales. I know that's true uh, in, uh, in our business. 20% um, of the customer accounts take, uh, go for 80% of the profits. Again, I know that's quite similar to a lot of businesses that I work with. And uh, one for the developers, 20% of most reported software bugs caused 80% of the software crashes. I'm sure anyone who's in development will absolutely agree with that as well. And finally, one that I very much agree with during the pandemic, 20% of your wardrobe is one 80% of the time. In that case, mine was pajamas. Don't know about you, but that's very much true for me. So it's not always an exact science. You can't just look at it, everything holistically and just say, right, this 20% absolutely gains 80% of my revenues. It's not always clear cut that. Could be 70, 30, could be 90, 10. It, the split's there, but the basic framework still stands. So what you need to do is review where your time and money is spent. What you need to do is look at your target market. Now, if your target market is 100 people, 10 of those will be an absolute perfect match for your company. The rest of them could be a bit of a nightmare, and there could be the 20% on the end of it you really don't want to work with at all, but they're still within your target market. So what you need to do is have a look at your target market and find who's your actual buying market. A lot of people use things like user personas or they'll use psychographics or they'll use pain points to identify these things. But what you'll find is it's still not the perfect buying audience, but with the data that you can review is absolutely vital for this. And finally, your media spend. One thing I notice time and time again, is particularly when I work in PPC, the client generally wants to spend all the budget across five, six different channels. They watch the Gary Vee video or something like that, and they want to put in four or 5,000 pounds in TikTok ads when they're a manufacturing B2B business. It doesn't really work out. Instead, what I suggest is concentrate on two, maybe three platforms, just put all your money into that. And you will definitely find clear patterns. <clears throat> So this is something that actually happened before I was at door four, but it's a very, very similar uh, framework. We also paired this with the, I believe it was a test and learn framework. Now this is an automotive claim. So in year one, we had 55% increase in order revenue. And then that was a 212% in year one as well. In year two, from applying the 80-20 principle, finding the, identi um, the products that converted the most, they scaled up the business within that. So it was nearly 200% up in order revenue, nearly 500% up in the total orders. And in year three, again, they created a sister brand just for these products that they found was most converting, and then it went on to get, get, get continual growth. And to this present day, they were 139% up at the moment. It's not even the year end. And this will continue forever and ever and ever, as long as they're a client of ours. Now, the thing is with 8020 is most people know it, but not a lot of people use it. Now, you've got some people who maybe look at it just as a marketing perspective. But again, like I mentioned, you will see patterns in other frameworks of life, whether it's products and services, customers, personal actions, or even employees. But I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight of how to actually frame it. So what I found from using Gates 20 is by focusing on the right 20% of the market to gain 10, even 100 times the success, it really guides a solid basis to build upon for 
really new businesses or even really mature ones. Often you'll identify onto markets and high profit opportunities that uh, you've got a persistent test and learn basis and you can really wouldn't be able to see that if you didn't have this t targeted framework rather than just having a big holistic digital marketing strategy. So as I said previously, data is your best friend. Here's the four key aspects that you need to review. First is your target audience. Second are your marketing channels. As I said, you don't need to be present on everything. You can just be present on three to four channels and make such a bigger bang on those channels rather than spreading yourself thin across the lot. And your sales process. There's definitely going to be holes in your sales process. There's going to be things that you can find within that that give you more bang for your buck than you would necessarily get from doing some soft lead stuff, maybe some like leaflets or something like that. And finally, your barriers to entry. If your website doesn't convert at the rate that it's supposed to do, that is a weak point in the chain. If you look at your whole holistic A to B sales process, you'll have a small fraction that you really need to focus on to get the biggest wins. So the framework, something that I like to think of, at least mentally, it's not always six weeks, sometimes it's six months, but this is kind of the thing that I go for. So I'll plan for six weeks of a budget and put 80% in the top performed uh, categories that I can possibly find and 20% into testing. Plan six weeks of my time to commit just to the best performing aspects of my marketing and just make them better. And third, no blogs. I've never met anyone who's become rich from blogging apart from bloggers. However, they do have the time and place I do appreciate the duty to be done, but in this framework, they're not that necessary. After your six weeks, clear, um, clear you'll finish everything. You'll find you probably have had seen an actual increase. Find your winners. You will have some losers, but find the winners. Then rinse and repeat that process. And I will leave you with this. If it's not going to bring you fame or fortune, it's probably not worth doing. Now, when I asked you at first, who is your favorite customer or client? It was probably quite an easy answer, or maybe it was a little bit harder. But if I asked you, who's your worst client or customer? I think that'd be an easier one to answer. I mean, I could answer that quite quickly, but they may be listening today. <laughs> but if you're using the eight to 20 principle, you are targeting the 20% of the market that you really want to work with. You're forgetting about the rest of the noise. You can get rid of the bad customers if you're just really honing your focus on that 20% of the market, ignoring the 80. So just to recap, review all aspects of your business, uh, particularly your marketing, find the 20s, find the best customers and how you want to want to work them, geographics, and they identify the customer niches. And two, focus your time and resources on making these the best they can possibly be. Now, I think we've got some questions later, but that's all for me. Sorry, I had to race through the talk. I'm very conscious on time. That's excellent. Thank you ever so much for that, Tom. Some no great way. stories there. And I think it's uh, there's a lot of info and guidance in there that all the marketers in here uh, can focus on. And I think a lot of those principles work in, in general life as well as marketing. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I think there's, there's a lot for people to, to take away. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, and like I said, any questions for uh, our distinguished head of, head of acquisition, please drop them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll post them to, to Tom later. Thank you. I'm now going to invite uh, Dominic Harrington to join us. Dominic is a CRM expert, he's a Zoho specialist, a published author, and he's worked with hundreds of business to, but just to improve their, their data and their commercial processes. Good morning to you, Dominic. Top of the morning yeah. to you. How are you doing? Yeah, good morning, Leon. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Fantastic. It's great to see you. Thanks for spending some time with us. And this morning, you're going to uh, tell our, our audience on LinkedIn and on Zoom uh, how to improve the business processes through uh, uh, optimizing CRM data. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Just before I start, can, can you see my screen? We can, we can see it. Yeah, you're looking absolutely solid, Dominic. Oh, thank you. Leon. I'll hand over to you and we'll, we'll be back for Q&A shortly. Brilliant. Okay, so um, just before I start, so thanks very much for having me. Actually, when Leon said the other, the other day um, that I'll be on third, I thought, oh, well done, Leon, you're saving the best for last there, aren't you? But but seriously, um, the, how good were the warm-up backs? You know, I, I really enjoyed the both talks and there was lots of synergies, especially in Tom's presentation. Uh, and you'll see that some of, some of the points, the really good points Tom was making uh, will be um, backed up by some of the stuff I'm going to say. So very briefly about myself, 20 years in IT, started off uh, at the same place as Leon, actually, at Time Computers, along with half of East Lanks, I think, um, and uh, spent a good 10 years uh, as a trainer, coach, implementation, project manager, 
Um, and then started my first business 10 years ago, just 11 years ago as a software company down in Exeter. Um, and then seven years ago, started CloudSource, wanted to do something more local. Um, so we've been a Zoho development partner now for seven years. Uh, we've done over 300 projects, got six apps on the marketplace, and as Leon mentioned, one book. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, so moving on, what I will talk about today. Um, just some of the current challenges with the CRM data. Then the impact that this will have on your performance marketing. Really important that you, you guys, everybody understands both, both things there. And then some of the solutions, some, some hopefully some takeaways for you, some things that you can take away and implement straight away within your businesses. Uh, and then just the, the summary at the end. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with a shock, shock headline. Uh, the information crisis. We are living uh, in an information crisis. And I bet you're all thinking, oh my word, there's a crisis everywhere. Every time I turn, there's COVID crisis, energy crisis. And this one is actually um, a good crisis if you're aware of it before most of the other people. So whilst this is a crisis, it's good for you guys to know about this because you can do something before most of the other people are aware. So when we're talking about this, I'm talking about a couple of different things, really. And the first one, so I'll just move my Zoom thing up away, um, is, is, is this, this fact. And this came from Zoho, actually. Uh, they told me earlier this year um, that 91% of CRM data is either stale, incomplete, or duplicated within 12 months. Um, and at first, that looks quite shocking. But actually, when you think about it, it it's, 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 it's probably spot on. And if you flip it on its head, that means that less than 10% of the data in your CRM is, is refreshed, is current, is complete, or isn't duplicated within 12 months. And that's a massive issue for reasons that I'll tell you shortly. And um, so second point is the cost. So one of the, one of the impacts of this information crisis is, is the cost to businesses. Um, now, uh, the data here has come from um, Gartner and DMB, uh, and it's in dollars, but it just, let's just assume it's pounds for the sakes of the UK audience. So, so okay, we'll just manage it pounds. Say it's on average $1 to acquire a single record. It takes $10 to manage it effectively. And by fact, manage it effectively, we mean on a CRM, in a CRM system with a user that's been trained and knows how to look after it and knows what to do with the data. So $10. But the bad news is, if you don't look after it, it'll cost you 10 times that to bring someone in to fix it. If you ever then want to give that information to somebody like Door 4 or to an agency that's going to do some performance marketing for you, then it's going to cost you 10 times that amount to fix it. So, so really important figures there to kind of remember and, and just to give you some context and, and why it's important. So how does this impact on performance marketing? So just before I dive into that, actually, um, I was conscious that not everybody may be familiar with what performance marketing is. Obviously, a lot of you will, but not everybody. So I just thought I'd put this out, out here, just so we're on the same page. So performance marketing is a comprehensive term that refers to online marketing and advertising programs in which advertisers and marketing companies are paid when a specific action is completed, such as a sale or a lead or a click. So we're, we're, we're paying the agencies based on the successful results. Okay, so uh, if I'm not right with that, Leon, you can tell me afterwards, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that's, uh, that's quite, quite on. So I'm just gonna minimize that. Um, right, so this is not, not the best graphic in the world. I, I appreciate that, but this is the data. When we talk about data in CRM, that's important, that's valuable for marketing. That's it right there. Those are the key attributes. And if you take one screenshot from my slideshow, be it this one, because this, th these are the things that, that I say to all my clients and to you guys, you need to aim for this information for every single record in your CRM, for every lead you put on the system, every contact, on, contact in the system, and also for the organizations, your clients, some of the bottom line, the, the things at the bottom line there. So I'm not going to read them all out, but hopefully you can identify with those. And as you can see, it's not rocket science. These, these are... These are things that we, we should know and we need to know and we need to find out. So what happens if we don't have that information? So what's the impact on, on, on performance marketing? Well, if we, if we, quite simply, if we don't have this information, we could be targeting the wrong people. 
Okay, so as Tom said, data is, is king. Um, so you, know, you need to know that we've got the right people so that we can target the right people, sorry. The relevance, if you think, think feels such a sector, job title, company size, if you have that information, then you make sure that the messaging is relevant to those people. Without it, it won't be. You're going to be going way at the mark, wide of the mark, because you're going to be aiming at the wrong. It's not going to be relevant to that person. And the third thing is personalization. So, you, you know, if you, you just have simple things like the name and the job title and their email address, we'll make sure that the messaging is going to be personalized and also, you know, overlaps with relevance there as well. But um, having the data, the correct data is going to make sure that you yeah, you be the right people talking to the right people your message is going to be relevant and it's going to be personal if you do those three things you're going to get much better engagement and you're going to have, it's going to help you to get much better results so here, here's my favorite graphic this is two minutes in canva this one um but it's really really just a couple, everyone really needs to know this and you probably do but just be just remind yourselves of it if you put in rubbish in, you're going to get rubbish out every time, every, all day long, rubbish in, rubbish out. And that's the same for CRM systems. And it's probably more apt in, you know, re really relevant in CRM systems. So how do we solve this? I'll just hit you with a lot of problems. Uh, how do we solve it? it? Wouldn't be fair to leave you without any solutions. Um, for me, there are three pillars of effective data management. There's audit, there's improving the data entry, because also, guess what? Us humans get it all wrong a lot, a lot of the time. And then also, where possible, eliminate data entry. That's the best one of the lot, but it's not always possible. So those three, those three things there are the pillars of, of effective data management. So let's just take a quick look at each one of them. So in terms of the audit, you really need to start considering your CRM data as an asset. Okay, it's not a tangible asset for many on, 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 the, on the balance sheet. Um, but you really need to treat it as such. So you should be doing an audit on that data every six to 12 months. You, how you do that, for some people, it's easier than others. You could just create some reports from within your CRM. You might have to extract data into the CR, into CSV and do it in Excel or some other tool. Um, you, you can focus on four modules and four modules only. Just focus on leads, deals, accounts, and contacts. You can pretty much forget the rest for most businesses. If you get those sorted out first, then other things could potentially follow, but that's where your focus needs to be. You need to check for actual and possible duplicate accounts and contacts. They are a scourge of a CRM system. If you've got two accounts, same name, multiple contacts, that can cause all sorts of issues, not just for marketing, but for customer service, sales, operations, etc. And then for each of the modules, those four modules, you need to make sure that the records have got those core data fields, those attributes. Think back to those um, pieces of the jigsaw. You need to make sure how many of your records have got that information. And, and then also, if you can, use an audit tool. Uh, I'm conscious that you know you guys might use um, different CRM systems, you're in Salesforce, HubSpot, Zoho, Pipedrive, others out there. Um, some of them may have an audit tool, so have a look. Here's an example of an audit tool that we, we've developed for, for our clients uh, you know, and future clients, just to show you the kind of things what an audit tool would look like. So you can see very, very graphical there. Uh, how are we doing overall? Um, what's that as a percentage? What percentage of our records have got, got these key fields in? And then where, where can we improve? What's red? What, what, what are we missing? Um, so we can then focus on, on, on that and then look at ways to improve it. So if you can get yourselves an audit tool on your CRM platform, that is going to save you a whole load of time. Second pillar um, is, the data, is, is the data entry. And really, we should aim to eliminate human error. And um, there's ways that we can do that very briefly. We can set fields as unique, which will then help us to avoid duplicates. So for example, the account name or the email. So if, if you're in your system in the setup, you can say, make this field unique. It will not allow you to have two fields, two records with the same name of account, company. And also for the contact, you can look at the email address. So if you can do that, do it. That saves you a massive headache. Also use mandatory fields. Lead source, where do your leads come from? How did you hear about us? Tom mentioned that in, in his talk. So important, all of our clients, we make that mandatory whether they ask us to or not. You know, it's, it's critical information. Uh, and then things like first 
name, email. If we know we need that, let's make it mandatory. So we eliminate the human error there. Um, and also in some of the other systems, some systems you can use page layout rules. So you can set additional fields as mandatory when, when you're progressing through the qualification or sales process. So I might not have this information at step one, but before we move to step three, I want to force the user to put it in. So if you do those things, you are going to help eliminate human error. Okay, so when we, the third thing is just eliminating data entry. So in 2021, we're, we're really lucky compared to 10 years ago, even five years ago. Um, the APIs, that, there's tens of thousands of APIs, it stands for Application Programmable Interface, which is a bit of a mouthful, which is why everyone refers to it as API. And it, and it allows users in a CRM to connect with any other third party system that also has an API. And that, in layman's terms, what that really means is we can get the information that we want, when we want it, how we want it. So as a result of this being available, I, I would say, um, yeah, I'll come on to that in a minute. Sorry, jumping ahead, conscious of time, whatever. Um, so the things that we want to be thinking about, so that looks great. It's not the best graphic, I know, but in terms of examples of that, let me tell you some. So examples of using an API to eliminate data entry as things like address lookup. We all know that we use it every time we buy on shop online, but can you do that within your CRM system? Email validation and searching for emails. That's kind of dead easy now if, we, if we're connecting to the right place. Information from company's house, critical for those doing B2B. And also if you're doing B2B, financial information on those companies. And if your business is doing tenders, um, then you can link it to a tender platform and those when, when something comes out, it'll be pushed straight into your system. So those are really good examples of, of how we can use API integrations to eliminate data entry. And I would say on the back of that for 2022, if any of you are looking for a new system, make sure you've got two prerequisites. Um, for me, the, CS, the system must have an API and it must be an open API with excellent documentation. If it doesn't have that, it's not fit for purpose. And also a marketplace. Salesforce has had a marketplace for over 10 years. They, they, were, they were, and still are the leaders, but other, other systems have caught up now. Uh, and if, you, if you've got a marketplace for the CRM, it's brilliant because it's an easy way to search for um, and install the API integrations that have already been done and they're ready to use. So if your system doesn't have that, it, it's not really fit for the future. I'm gonna just, give, just almost finish off now with a little example of, of what is possible. I've talked around APIs, I've talked around the different types of integration. So to bring that to life, Apologies for my loud, loud typing here. I do, I do get um, shouted at for that uh, at home, but there you go. So we're just going to put a, a lead on. So we've just got the basic information, the last name, the first name, the website, and the name of the company. Lead source I mentioned before, mandatory field. We can't do anything without that. The next information we want is the address. So where are they? So we click on a button. So it might, in your system, if you get this, it might just be in, pop up in the field itself, but this is a pop up, choose the country, put in the postcode or the first line of the address. So we all use this every day, that will match the address. And then you click on save, let's push those address fields into the system. So there's very little data entry there. That's a valid address, everything that is gonna, that's gonna get there. Um, and if we click on save, we then, want, might, we, men, we then might want a bit more information about the person, we might ideally want to try and find their LinkedIn profile or their email address. So we can use tool APIs out there that will help us with that. And this one's built into the system. So you just hit search. It's just looking up against the domain. And then you see a list of employees. Um, we can also see their email address. That's a verified email address. And we can see their job titles. And then we can also see whether we've got access to their social media profile as well. So we find the one that we, we want. So it might be the original one we put in, it might be somebody else and we see the other people there. And there we go, that's pushed that information straight into the system. So you can see their email address is now there, their job title is there, and also their social media link. So if you think back to that jigsaw puzzle I showed you before, look at how much of that information we've got already now. Um, and a lot of this has been passed, given to us through the API. 
And then in terms of the, you know, the relationship manage, building up a relationship with our targets there, you click on LinkedIn, that will open their individual profile. And from there, obviously you could, you could send them a message or send them a connection request, or in this case, just follow them. Um, okay, so that's an example. Uh, and the last one coming right up is for UK companies only at the moment, which, which we all are here, I think. So you just do, um, we do a credit check. We use, we use a partner for red flag alert for this data. Um, so it's, it's, it's brilliant, it's prime data, it's refreshed every day. Uh, and you'll see the type of information we can pull through using the API. That's going to find the, the limited company. So I just click on update. And then if we just wait a couple of seconds, that's going to grab some information through the API and put it into your CRM. So we can now see a lot more. We've got the company number. We've got when they were incorporated, a phone number. Are they TPS registered? Are we going to get shouted at if we ring them? Actual employees, turnover, um, and also the insolvency rating. So uh, anyone's interested, you can find out more later at another time. But this is silver, so that's very good. You know, they go gold, silver, bronze, amber, and so on. So hopefully that's that's because it's useful, gives you a bit, a bit of an example of the types of things that we can do and, and with CRM and, and API integration. And then finally, so just to, to hopefully give you four things I want you to really take away from today. And again, feel free to screenshot this or, or whatever you want to do. You really need to, for next year, if you want the data to help you with your performance marketing, you need to treat your, your data as an asset. You need to audit it regularly. You need to look after it. You need to take steps to eliminate human data entry issues, as I've just shown you some examples of. And then you need to know, and this is a fact, that the better data manager, if you manage that data better, you will get better results from your performance marketing, without a shadow of a doubt. And, um, and there, there we go, Leon, over to you. Well done. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Dominic. That's a superb, insightful presentation into a, a topic that I'm quite passionate about myself in CRM and managing customer data. So thanks to you and thanks to our other three uh, speakers, Jamie, Mark and Tom, who I'm going to invite back into uh, Vision now for Q&A. We've been lucky enough to have quite a lot of questions asked by our attendees today. So hello again, everybody. I'm glad that you've, you've stuck with us. Um, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for dropping back in. I've got a few questions uh, here from our attendees. So uh, from Matt Holmes, for, uh, for Mark and Jamie, working in social care, every organization can easily forward a social purpose, but how can branding purpose influence customers within a market like this within social care? Well, from, from my point of view, the, the main thing really, Leon, I think is, uh, is to be authentic at, uh, at all stages. Um, giving an example, working with a social housing association in Bolton, um, as Matt says there, it's very easy for them to publish their, their social purpose and, and, and make a big deal of it. Um, but uh, what it needs to do is align with other parts of uh, what's going on in the business. So, for example, they did have a social purpose, which obviously is, is quite often to make the lives of their residents better. Um, but they also have a VFM statement, which is value for money. And as part of that, the newsletter that they used to send out every month, um, they decided to knock it on the head because obviously it was, um, from a sustainability point of view, it was, was not what they deemed that they should be doing. Um, they wanted to move over to um, digital. They wanted to get their residents online and, and seeing the newsletter and things like that online. But of course, many social housing associations have a very aged population and they could have been alienated. They could have just said, well, we're going to move over to digital anyway. Leave those people and, you know, it's kind of, it's just one of those things. <clears throat> but what they did instead were they installed computers, tablets, things like that in various drop-in centres. They had people from their organisation going round and getting people online. And so there was a real commitment to... Um, move over um, to a more sustainable practice, but also to make sure that in line with their kind of social purpose was to make sure that, that they didn't leave uh, leave the residents behind and, and they wanted to uh, make their lives better. 
Superb. Good answer. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, Tom from uh, Matt Simmons. Uh, how often do you recommend that you run uh, A-B testing for paid media accounts? Sure. Um, I'm afraid that's quite a short and sweet answer, but all the time. <laughs> it's always about the incremental wins. So you really are always got to be reviewing the data almost on a weekly basis sometimes. Um, and you've always got to be trying new things. So I'm afraid it's a Superb, short. Superb, yeah. Always be learning. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Superb. Uh, and we have a question for, for Dominic. Um, and you touched on APIs in there. And again, a subject close to my heart. We talked about APIs and integrations with, with CRM. Um, you know, what do you think are the most valuable integrations that businesses can operate to integrate with CRM? Which, which of those would you say are the most essential for, for most businesses? I realize everybody's different. Yeah, good question. I, I think, again, it's a short answer, actually. So we were on with short answers today. Um, the two things, one is email. And the other one is your calendar. For me, for, that is a prerequisite now. You have to integrate with those two. Otherwise, your team are flying blind in, 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 and for, the, for the email communication. And meetings, you, you absolutely need to be booking those meetings through the CRM, linked to all your, all, your, all your customer information. But you need to sync it with your Outlook or your Google because that's got a two-way sync because other people are going to invite you to meetings. So you need to have just that one diary. So I think the answer is, is, is those two applications are critical superb thanks dominic and that's really going to bring our event to a close today that's the end of decoding digital it's good to be bad i'd like to thank all four of our speakers today for uh, giving up a hefty chunk of the morning to be with us and be part of that, this event um a quick word about december's decoding digital hopefully most of you have enjoyed this enough to come and join us again uh, we'll be running the event uh, again on zoom and on linkedin live wednesday the 15th of december uh, we'd encourage you to, to register in advance. Registering for Zoom means you, you can ask our uh, delegates questions a little bit more simply. Next month, we have three speakers, Steph Bridgman from Experienced Media Analysts, uh, Roger Longdon from There Be Giants, and James Hayes of Parcel Hub. Um, three very knowledgeable professionals, all uh, excellent speakers. And we also look for speakers for future events. Into 2022, we will be looking at starting to run in-person events again. And we're looking for smart, knowledgeable people who understand brand, digital performance and all the topics that appeal to the modern marketer. So keep your eyes out for the next event uh, for our next speakers. This is bringing us to, a uh, to an end. Thanks very much for joining us and we will see you next time. <laughs>